being interested in working with paint and ended up taking a um, abstract painting class at NECA. Um, but before that, I, um, I have a daughter, her name is Abigail, and she has autism. Um, early on, we realized that she was uh, developing slower, um, not meeting her milestones. And so being an artist, an illustrator, being very busy in my profession, having to put a lot aside um, to advocate for her. And um, so that's kind of where the art sort of started to blend for me and working with my art and um, trying to express what I was feeling, um, raising my daughter. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, I'm Alicia Etheridge. Um, I'm so happy you all are here today. Um, I am a painter. Um, I worked as a first as a grief counselor in Portland for about six years previous to having my um, son. Um, and I worked with expressive arts in that practice. Um, so art has always been a part of my work. Um, both of my parents were artists and I grew up in a home where my mom's studio was down in the basement and my dad gardened and had these beautiful gardens all over. Um, and my mom's sculptures would move into the garden. And so it was just like always around as a way of communicating, um, as a way of communication and expressing uh, oneself. Um, I started painting full time uh, after my son. My, so my son was born with congenital heart disease. He had four open heart surgeries and then ultimately needed a life saving heart transplant when he was 18 months old. Uh, he was diagnosed at 15 months with very severe heart failure. Um, and it was intense. <laughs> and it was really dark times for a while, um, not knowing if he would survive long enough to receive uh, a new heart. Um, fortunately, he did, and it transformed our family forever and transformed him. Um, he is a very healthy eight-year-old now um, who was pestering me right before I came here <laughs> this afternoon. Uh, a lot of energy. Um, he's a, a history buff now, um, and in a similar way with, with Celeste, um, and just knowing that with grief, um, from my training as a social worker, you know, like you need to process. <laughs> um, you need to process all of this stuff. And for me, it had to happen visually. Um, I did a lot of therapy also, um, but, but visually was really where it needed to come out. And even though he's been um, healthy for the most part, there's been blips along the way um, in terms of needing to go back to the hospital, um, having some developmental challenges. Um, hi, Brenda. Come on in, there's chairs. <laughs> We're all friends. Um, there's yeah. chairs yeah. right there that you could just drive yeah. in with you. So, yeah, so I also went to Mecca um, after having Wesley um, and met Celeste there um, in that abstract painting class, which sort of set things into motion for the show. I'll let you. I said enough. <laughs> oh, I, I love hearing this because I know it a, a little about but maybe it's fun hearing more. <laughs> um, so my name is Martha Miller. Uh, I'm an artist. I uh, I call myself a drawer more than um, painter. Um, I did major in printmaking, um, but I my preferred medium is typically mixed media. Although the work that I have in this show are all charcoal drawings, and I, I do love uh, straight up charcoal, and I have worked in charcoal for years. Um, so let's see, I had five children by the time I was 29, and um, I moved to Maine from Rhode Island in the 70s. And I connected with a wonderful group. Some of you may know of Pat and Dwight Hardy, uh, George Burke, Lincoln Perry, um, Janet Mannion. I'm trying to think of some of the other people that met weekly up in Dwight Hardy's barn in the summer and in their living room in the winter, because that's where the wood stove was with a model and work from the figure. Um, the figures always been my first love. Um, even as a child, I grew up in Rhode Island and uh, was fortunate to go to 
RISD Saturday morning classes from second grade to eighth grade. And I really think that's like where I got the mm. most of my education. There's my foundation. Mm. And I did a lot of figure drawing at a young age. Um, but keeping art alive while being a young mom was really a hard challenge at the beginning. Um, after the birth of my fourth child, which kind of interestingly is Lisbeth, mm. who is, you know, portraits are here today. I had a really difficult postpartum, like to just severe anxiety, depression, and got into counseling and therapy for the first time in my life. And I remember one of the, the first things my therapist said to me, because here I was just trying to, oh, I'll be creative in baking muffins, and I'll be creative in making a new pillow cover, and I'll, you know, knit. And meanwhile, you know, my dark shadow side which I always call my beast, yeah. was not being acknowledged. And I remember the therapist just looking at me and she's saying, run, do not walk to the art supply store. <laughs> Go get yourself some paper, get whatever you need to draw with and just start drawing. And I mean, I'm getting chills just telling you this now because it was a big turning point for me. Um, I had been very active as an artist as a teenager. Um, but I had some really tough experiences that made me afraid of that part of myself and afraid of the part of myself that could draw my shadow side and put it in front of me. That was just really frightening. So um, anyway, that was a huge turning point for me. Um, I went ahead and had another baby. <laughs> and I have some really wonderful drawings where I was the model during one of those um, figure drawing sessions. I arrived one day and, and one night to draw and they said, we want you to model tonight. And I was hugely pregnant. And they all, instead of having like the typical baby shower, they all drew me <laughs> big and pregnant. So I have some really wonderful portraits of myself, big with child. Um, I just, I really started um, just prioritizing getting to that drawing group and whatever it took to draw while I've got little kids all around. And I would literally close the bathroom door with a pad of paper and go do, if I could do a five minute self portrait in here, that's what I'll do. Um, and uh, so things were rolling along. I started to show my work uh, down at Mass Cove Gallery. As a matter of fact, that's where I first showed my work. And then my daughter, Lizbeth became ill. And it, it was just another huge, um, just a big challenge. How do I continue to be creative now with this daughter who has, you know, well, she had a traumatic brain injury from a viral illness. And it was like a death mm -hmm. because she went into this and came out with someone who has uncontrolled seizures. Her short-term memory had been blown. Uh, she was just a, a totally different girl. And we had a whole new set of uh, issues to deal with. Um, but I just, re I have always, like I said, remembered that therapist saying, you've got to draw, you've got to keep drawing. It's going to save your life. And it's basically has saved, has saved my sanity to be able to express the grief as we're talking about and just the huge, it's just huge having a child with special needs. It's hard being a parent, period, but um, anywho, so um, what did I do? I went back to school when I transitioned my daughter to living on her own, which we did when she was 21. Uh, at age 48, I went back to Maine College of Art to get a degree in printmaking. And that felt like a resuscitation um, because really in the midst of this caregiving, I forgot I was an artist sometimes. And uh, just felt completely depleted. So that was great. And I, I graduated from there and then I started teaching immediately there through continuing studies, life drawing and portraiture. And then I had a wonderful class drawing for seniors, which I love. But that's where I met these two wonderful women. Yeah. You were in my, was it portraiture or life drawing? In my time? <laughs> or, or maybe you might have been in two. Yeah. 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 And so interesting that we connected in that, oh, guess what? <laughs> I have a 
I have a child too. And, um, and we started percolating the thoughts of wouldn't it be cool because we knew we had all made work about this. It just felt so private. Who's going to want to see it kind of stuff, you know, yeah. And, yeah. and also felt important knowing that the isolation. Oh, yeah, right. And, and trying to break that break through that right and showing that we found one another. Um, but also wanting to show up for other parents who have been who, who are walking this path right and letting them know that they're not alone not alone that is key i know i'm older than you guys and uh i did feel so isolated when lizbeth became sick in 1988 and um you know it's a gift to have forums like this in the internet where suddenly mm -hmm. there are so many families that i see on instagram and on facebook that are dealing with these really rough challenges. We're not alone at all in it. And uh, yeah, I think it's just really important to share. <laughs> well, you guys have done a pretty good job of answering my first question, which is how did you first get together and like, come up with the idea for the show? Um, so, so I'll skip to the next one. Um, obviously your lives factor so much into your work, especially into this work. Can you talk about how having kids um, especially your kids that have these challenges has impacted your creative practice. Does it look different now than it did before having kids? Yeah, I, uh, it gave me the courage to take the plunge to do it full time. Um, I think before it was definitely a way of my processing maybe my, my inner world. Um, but after going through the intensity of the first two years of life with, with Wes, um, I was like, why, like, why hold back? You know, why not do what we love doing? You know, let's do that. And that's with an incredible support network. <laughs> I was able to do that. I know that that's not um, not the case for everyone. I, I realize that, um, but I really felt like I, I, like I had to do this thing. And I think that was one of the biggest gifts that he gave me. You know, as his mom. Um, was to really lean into this, 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 this part of me that that has to this beast, right? That I like, I have to do it, you know. Um, and and it's just it's happening in this really organic way. That's beautiful. Um, you know, I did not go to art school, and I, I did a lot of art classes throughout my life. Um, I met the sanctuary, at, you know, with my my inner life teacher would just like do my contemplative arts. Like I've, I've had a lot of art training, um, but yeah, it just like, it let me take the plunge to be an artist and, and to show up and be, be doing what I love. Um, awesome. It is awesome, you know? And, and there's also like the part of it that's, that is there are periods of time where I've had to adapt. Like I'm not gonna work on big 43 by 60 inch painting <laughs> because we're in crisis, you know? And so I work on three by five note cards that I keep in my journal that I bring on vacation to my friends' houses, you know, um, or, or I did it yesterday. I, on Thursday, we were in the cat lab and I worked on those um, in the waiting room or he's <laughs> having a medical procedure and under general anesthesia and having a biopsy done on his you know, So it's like you figure out a way because it becomes so vital. It is who you are. It is what you have to do. You, 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 you navigate that and find other ways to get that to keep feeding into the practice. Um, um, well, I can say that, I mean, and right now at this moment, I feel that full well of producing and feeling the full mm. um, vocabulary of what I'm doing, but I didn't start that way. Mm -hmm. I felt for me, it was um, very slow, incremental, um, you know, I had to drop being an illustrator. So that was this huge, like, just being a mother um, was huge to have to kind of slow that down. And then when Abigail arrived, it was like, oh my God, I have to let this go. Um, it just, I couldn't seem to do both. Um, so there was a lot of years where I didn't do art. I was, I was, you know, running um, to figure out how to help her. Um, and it wasn't until a little later where it was like, 
I'd been in kind of the crisis of her having autism, you know, realizing it was um, pretty severe in terms of her communication and her muscle tone and working to find providers that I, um, then I realized, okay, I'm, I'm in this for the long haul. So I better start kind of waking up and mm -hmm. um, seeing what I can do with my skills as an artist. How can I communicate this? Um, but I was still shy about it and feeling really self-conscious about it. And I don't know if you have felt that where I felt like I, um, I didn't want to stand out. You know, I wanted to kind of just do the natural, what I thought was like the typical family thing. And so it took me a while to wrap my head around being um, kind of open with it and talking to people about it. Um, but I think what got me was just that the regiment of all the providers I had to see over so many years, all the waiting rooms I had to go into and watch all these parents there trying to figure out how to help their child. And, um, and it just started to feel beautiful to me in some way. It was about just this endurance that everyone had. And I, then I just started feeling this like, how can I make this into something beautiful? How can I express what's going on in my life that I see obviously is happening with everyone else, but um, we're just so damn tired. And um, <laughs> so, um, so I kind of held that for a really long time. And then, um, and I sort of came to where Abigail was maybe, you know, in her early, I don't know, maybe she was eight or nine. And I realized I have to do something. And that's when I took that Mecca uh, painting class. And, um, and I was noodling in my basement, you know, just kind of painting and drawing and trying to kind of express it. Uh, but when that, when I met Alicia and she was, you know, she started telling me about her family and her son. And I approached her and I said, wouldn't it be nice? Can we figure out how to do this? How can we, and that was like 2015. And, um, and that's sort of where it bubbled for me, where I felt, and it was the paint. It was also just painting it and not knowing, and that painting class that we took was abstract. So it wasn't as though I was going to be drawing, which I love to draw figuratively. I love to like be realistic with my drawing. Now I was being asked to kind of open up and show the emotion, that piece of it. And what does that look like? You know, how does that feel? And that's when it really, I think, cracked me open. And I just felt like, oh, I can use the skills that I have and I can bring all this emotion that I feel and anger and just pissed off and also in love about it all. How can I kind of mold it and bring it into my work? And so, I mean, I, I think I think of myself as a painter now, but I think kind of the thread of it all is being an illustrator. How do I narrate this experience? Mm -hmm. Anything you add there? Yeah, so um, my work has been figurative all along, as I've said. Um, I've also, um, I've always done a lot of self-portraits ever since I was, I think I started making them when I was about 15 years old. And um, they've always been kind of a, you know, a visual diary or a mm -hmm. journal. They're not about my outer appearance at all. They're more about my internal state mm -hmm. at each time that I make one. And um, as I said, I was, you know, working from the figure quite a bit uh, before Lizzie became sick. and. After she became ill, I did some really intense self-portraits that were, you know, wrestling with why this happened and so forth. And, um, but I hadn't truly grieved what happened to her. So with Lizzie, it's like a real before and after. She was just this normal, healthy kid till she was six years old. And then, um, and again, in therapy, I've had a ton of it. Um, I was in a wonderful um, therapy group, and then I started seeing this one counselor one-on-one, -on -one, and um, he helped me face my grief about Lizbeth's illness, and um, I think another turning point for me was a self-portrait that was directly about 
Lisbeth being ill and in the hospital and, um, and working on that, I, it was a, you know, a floodgate that opened where I allowed myself to finally grieve what happened to her. There's even tear splashes on this particular drawing. And um, so, you know, it's very been a therapeutic vehicle for me, for sure. Um, uh, and that sort of allowed me to start to really make work about Liz, um, because sometimes it's hard. Yeah. I don't want to look at it. I don't want to face it. And yeah. um, but about oh, was it in 2018? I had a big show called "The Is of Liz," and it's just a huge series of or a series of huge drawings yeah. of Liz Beth. But also I incorporated her art into these portraits because, I mean, we're talking about children and art and how, you know, how do your children affect your art? Well, I have five kids and they're all really creative in so many ways. So they have fed me back. Um, but uh, Lizzie would do these fascinating drawings when she was in her postdictal state, which is the state after a seizure where she's just not fully conscious. And they are the most trippy things and they're beautiful. Um, I mean, they're really like somebody who's flying on something. And, um, and I love them. And she would come out of that fog and see those drawings and say, no, I don't like that. Who did that? She had no memory of it. And I mean, they're, they're profoundly beautiful. Um, so I felt like she was helping me open up to that place that she would be in um, when I did that series. Um, I don't know, having, having I kind of do things in bundles, like I kind of go overboard. I always bite off more than I can chew, you know? So hey, let's have five kids and, um, <laughs> and, and, you know, and it's like, now what do I have to do to survive and climb up to the top and still draw? And I guess I like a challenge. <laughs> um, so, so we know that your lives as caregivers translate into your work. Um, do any of you find that you're, creative practice impacts the way that you provide care now or mm -hmm. navigate the responsibilities that you have? Mm. Well, I know that I have to balance my life to make myself have enough energy to help Abigail. And so it's a lot of self-care. I find myself trying to, to balance the two um, so that I... Uh, can keep it all going. Because mm -hmm. when I have to drop it, I really have to drop it. And so when I come back, I want to make sure that I don't have to do too much recovering, I think. And um, I think that's kind of where it's at, but I also know, yeah. yeah. I, I think for me, um, Not, not that the, the, this wouldn't have happened, but I think that my, um, so a lot of the work is, that's here is uh, really inspired by my kids' imaginations or, or just truly like sourcing their, their, their imaginative worlds and my showing up for that um, and wanting to spend that time being there with them in that space. Um, because we've had, you know, I mean, like, yeah, just, just really wanting to be present for that. Um, and then, yeah, so it's like, I, I feel like in a way, um, I know, I know. That, um, yeah, it's like they're, they're part of it, you know. Like they're really, they're really part of it. Um, I felt it was important uh, for a while. I had my studio outside my home because 
um, of the materials I wanted to use and didn't want to have little people around oil paint and all of the stuff that comes with that. Um, but I still would bring them with me sometimes, you know, and, um, you know, they're like, they're underfoot, like, they're part of it. And, and in terms of my, and I think that that's a way of my showing my care and my love for them too, mm -hmm. you know, is, is that, is that they are. Like there's, there's, I don't, I don't, I feel like it's just so, they're, they're so blurred, like there's not, um, what do we say? It's like the art spills into life and the life spills into the right. art and it spills into that, that caring piece. Um, and it's a trip, like getting crits from them. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, observing themselves, um, you know, and then their requests, like, can you please like, you know, paint me as, you know, whatever the character is that they want to be. Um, so, yeah, I like I think in the way that was modeled for me that you can you can communicate through the creativity like mm -hmm. that's become a language that I've um, developed with them as well. Um, and I think in terms of like the actual like medical part of the care for my son. Um, I, I've had to learn, I've learned and gotten better in knowing like the art, the creative practice is always going to be there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and, and honestly, like, you know, when Wes was in the more critical period of his illness, um, and when we were coming out of that, you know, like, what my husband like went back to work because someone needed to be to manage as Celeste was saying all of these appointments and we were looking back and like when even when he was still three like a year out from the transplant it's like he had 11 different providers you know that we were and that's not counting like the OT the PT the speech you know all of that stuff it's, these are like those are the doctor like the medical stuff that we were you know in constant contact with um so it's like I've like learned to have breath and acceptance that like there are going to be these times when where I'm more focused on that and I and I can bring the art to it and then it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna feed me later on like even you know and that and that's been like this other piece I think with all of almost all of the work in here is like really I've learned you know that the grief and the joy can occupy the same space you know and that's been a big learning too um, around around how I can be with my kids. Mm -hmm. and, that's a really beautiful part of, of all of the work in here, yeah. I think. Um, anything you want to? If not, okay. <laughs> um, so um, the grief and joy really resonates for me. I, um, I know I'm hopping again to one of the other questions, That's but fine. questions <laughs> about symbols. And um, yeah. when um, Lisbeth first became ill, I started to dream about hummingbirds all the time. And I had I didn't grow up seeing them in Rhode Island and um, and I didn't see them a lot when I lived in southern Maine. But when we moved, we moved to uh, Woolwich, Maine in 1988, uh, just a month before Elizabeth became ill. Um, and then I started to see them in the yard at our new at our new home. And um, they were permeating my dreams so often that I thought, OK, I've got to like, look this up. And, you know, what do they symbolize in different cultures and mythologies and so forth? And um, the big thing that I learned is that they represent joy and eternity. They've got that, the way their wing beats is a figure eight, which is the sign for eternity. And, and so I just felt like I was just getting this very direct message that you're going to have joy, eternal joy, even in the midst of this really painful, hard stuff that you're going through. And so um, I started hanging hummingbird feeders and I've had them coming to my house now for you know, almost 30 <laughs> years. And, um, and they, they show up often in my work and I'm actually wearing a little <laughs> hummingbird today. But, you know, these, these symbols, um, 
and these messages, which I call messages from spirit, um, feel so important. They're the things that have sustained me. And I want to share that in my work. Um, and again, sometimes I think, oh, this is too quirky and personal. Um, but heck no, this is, <laughs> you know, this is how spirit works. And um, all different occupations, we have ways of, of expressing that. I just happen to be an artist and it's going to come out visually. Um, but um, as far as um, my caregiving being affected by my art, one very distinct thing is that um, when I did that deep grief work, you know, really faced what I call, I call it now the is of Liz. Like you have, we have to just accept this shit that happens to us. Yeah. You know, we can rail against it and so forth, but at some point it's okay, this is how it is. <laughs> and Liz is spelled L-I-S. Um, once I did that deep grief work, I was able to be a stronger advocate for her. And my heart, my heart, <laughs> my heart, my art, and my heart. Yeah, my art helped me get to that place of deep grieving and acceptance. Um, so let's, I'll, I'll switch gears a little bit. Um, we can talk about some of the specific works in here. Um, Celeste, I'll start with you. The services in your work are so rich. And if you haven't yet, I would invite all of you to get up close and stick your nose right in there. Um, <laughs> there's so many beautiful pieces in there and different materials that are kind of hidden and, and they come out as you get up and engage with the work. Um, I'm looking at, uh, you know, the sewing patterns or t-shirt scraps or maps and the piece down on the end here. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the meaning or significance behind those different materials and, and how you sure. find them and incorporate them? Yeah. Um, well, the sewing patterns actually, it's funny, in, let's see, was it 2015? I did a show, it was my first little show about Abigail. And um, I did it in a little cafe in, in Portland. And it was, how do we make our daughter? And I just felt like, you know, with my son's here, Julian, like when he would develop, he would do something. I would turn the page and he would do the next thing. It'd be like, there it is. But with Abigail, it was like, there, there's just no continuity here. And so I had to kind of rethink how I just had to um, just kind of follow her and kind of be more organic. Um, and the sewing patterns come from this idea of making. Uh, I grew up with my mother sewing a lot. She um, sewed a lot of her clothes growing up. I learned how to sew through her. Um, with the paper itself, it's, it's thin. Um, it has a lot of really cool lines. <laughs> and so I started playing around with laying sewing patterns down and stitching on them and kind of creating this texture that I think has evolved into, into my paintings. Um, and the sewing patterns come and go. Sometimes they get fully covered. You don't even know they're there, but it, it begins with a sense of, sort of a, a map a little bit or a distraction or a crutch. I'm not sure what it is, but <laughs> it helps me kind of just begin. Um, and, and then I'll, I'll leave some of them in to, because I just love the little designs they make, uh, the little moments that come through. Um, this one here has a lot, evol it evolved slowly. Um, I love to stitch. And I love fabric, so sometimes I'll just stitch on fabric, and then I just have these beautiful little strips of, I think they're beautiful, little strips of fabric, with little stitches on them, and I'm like, okay, now I'm painting. Let me, I'm just going to glue this on. <laughs> and, um, and I couldn't say exactly why I attached that piece of t-shirt material, but it got a lot of paint on it from painting on me, and I cut it, and I just loved it, and it just went on. Um, so I have found over the years that with, I love texture and paint. I love creating a surface. I love hammering into it. I love that feeling of that tactile experience as I work. And, um, 
And a big, a big part with me and Abigail is that she's nonverbal, um, pretty much. She uses sign language, she uses an augmented language device, she uses a picture, a picture system called PEX. Um, but she can't answer questions uh, very well or really comment on what she is thinking. So when she does say a sentence, when she does tell the world something, mm. I find it to be these gems and I just <laughs> hold on to them and I write them down. And um, I did a lot of journaling when Abigail was little, just like a day. I would just look at a day as kind of this, like, okay, I'm just gonna record a day of Abigail. Mm. And it'd be like this little poem, just all of the things that she would do. And I found them to be so beautiful. Um, but then, the sentences that she says along the way have just really dug deep in our family. And um, so there are a lot about that. There, um, like the, there's a piece on the wall, that short little wall there, it says, mama swim. And um, she loves to swim and she's telling me, you know, mama swim, uh, mama let's go swimming, it's mama swim, um, other things like that. And then I feel like I'm her sort of cheerleader <laughs> um, so like for this painting, for me, it's about, um, I want her to achieve as much as she can. I want her to climb that tree. I want her to give it all. And I'm sort of her cheerleader and trying to, um, promote that and, uh, kind of bring beauty in that process of her developing the way she is and enjoying it for, for that. Um, so yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Um, we'll, we'll put Alicia back in the hot seat. Um, <laughs> the imagery in your work um, is so wild and fantastical, and I love it. Um, you said it pulls a lot from your children's imaginations, but I know there's a lot of other influences in there as well, um, and some interesting processes that you use to get there. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? I can talk about that. Um, so in the last two and a half years, um, I have come back to my uh, contemplative arts practice and really go through a ritual of dropping into my, my body and my, before I start working. Um, I think that previous to that, that process didn't work for me because I had so much pent up rage <laughs> and anger of like, why is this happening to my child? And just like, like it didn't feel good to like be in, it did not feel good to be in my body. It felt, it felt really bad. Um, I also had some postpartum depression after my daughter and anxiety. And it was just like, I have like the, I feel like the art I made then was about discharging and releasing that in a lot of ways of getting that part out in a really beautiful refined <laughs> you know it was trans, it was it was a transform it was discharged with transforming that those that the immensity of, of that part of um of my experience um but I've, I've really shifted um and so I do I I have a um a poem that I read that has movements that go with it. Um, I learn some Palo Santo. I do prayer. Um, I've integrated um, working with different um, with the chakras. Um, and yeah, just like I with with all of <laughs> with all of the 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 stuff that you do as a parent. Um, it's like I need to, I, I need that grounding first um, to arrive and discern what it is that, where, where I'm going to go with the work. Um, and it feels really, it feels really good. Like it feels, it's been a, it's been a big shift in the last seven years. Um, and so with that, um, I am looking like I have a bunch of oracle decks that I draw from. I have an animal spirit one. I have a Celtic goddess one. Um, I have, what is this? Oh, I, got, I love that stuff. <laughs> got a lot of magic stuff around. <laughs> um, and so I am. So I'm, I'm using those to help me notice things that I'm noticing either when I'm out 
with my kids. Um, but here, I have, a, I have a, a plant one as well. Um, and so I'm looking to them. I'm looking to the meaning of the horse, of the deer, um, of these animals that are that are showing up again and again and again and again and again in my in my waking life and sometimes in my dream life too. Um, and and what is what is the symbolism? Like how does that reflect my relationship with my children, my relationship, you know, with the world? Um, and so I'm bringing those in, um, doing some research about what what that what that is. Um, and then I'm also bringing in the the play, you know, and the the imaginative. My daughter is <laughs> she is a trip. Um, at bedtime, she sings these songs that are amazing. I record them. I will borrow from her imaginative <laughs> world. Um, you know, she's really because she's you know she's she's going to be five soon, but. She's like, she's right there, totally plugged into the spirit world. You know, that, that veil is super thin for her. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's beautiful. Um, but yeah, I mean, like the, in the depths is, you know, we, they, Wesley was obsessed with sharks. <laughs> and because Wesley was obsessed with sharks, Emma became obsessed with sharks. And then we had to get shark costumes and we lived in the shark costumes for, or they lived in the shark costumes for a while. Um, and it's awesome about being in the depths with two young kids. And that was like in pandemic and it was, belly of the lamb. Yeah, right. <laughs> it was really um, an intense time, um, but also having to like be there for them to to um, interpret, you know, how we're going to navigate mm -hmm. this new new way of being. Um, you know, in the the deer were um, very prominent figures for our family. Um, again, in early pandemic, they would come right up into the backyard and hang out. And my son was like, well, we have to build a deer hospital for them. This was part of his journey, right? Of like giving back to the animals and being a, you needed to be a protector, right? So we cleared this path and we built a hospital in the, in the back of our house. Um, and that was the fawn hospital where the mom could go in and safely give birth to her baby, which is like, you know, I think a lot of his story, like his mom needed a place, needed to go to a place to, that was safe. I was supposed to deliver in Portland. I ended up in Boston <laughs> to, to safely, for him to safely arrive. Um, and that's him in a Commander Cody costume. You know, that was a walk in the woods with my daughter on my shoulders because, you know, when you're two and a half, you get tired and you ride on your parents for the rest of the walk, <laughs> the last two miles or whatever. Um, so, and so for me, with, with the majority of the paintings here, um, I, knowing that I was in this transitional time of like getting the big emotion out, I do the abstract backgrounds first. Okay, so that happens first, right? Um, I, build up, I build up the surface. You know, a lot of these, these there's a lot of paint on these paintings. <laughs> um, and then once that comes through, um, I'm able to kind of weave in the the story um, that I'm that I'm telling, um, and I still work like that. I think I really do kind of build up build up the backgrounds um, and kind of bring in the imagery through through that other, through that process of dropping in. Yeah. Well, Martha, you already answered your question, but I'll ask you a sneaky another one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I know a lot of your your other work um, is very colorful. Is is there a specific mm -hmm. reason why all of these pieces are in black and white? Yeah, um, and again, I have I go through phases where I'm just in black and white. It's sort of like a palette cleanser. Like I've got to get away from the color for a while um, and just get back to just that basics. But uh, this set of drawings. It was um, created after one of my daughter's most recent hospitalizations. And um, she, the last two summers, she's had a couple of uh, really close calls where we almost lost her to sepsis and, you know, infection. And um, I would photograph her while I was in the intensive care unit with her. And that was like my one way to, and I, I would sometimes do little tiny drawings when I had a minute to, um, but just 
to process the intensity of that. I can remember, well, she had been hospitalized in June, this last June, like a year ago. And then when I finally got to the point where I kind of work in cycles, I, I don't usually do a lot of my art in the thick of summer. It's like August 1st rolls around and I've got to be back in my studio. Mm -hmm. And I just remember thinking, I need charcoal. Mm -hmm. It was just a need. I need charcoal. I need charcoal to express the depth of how hard that was. Um, and um, I use a lot of uh, imagery from my dreams. I've kept dream journals, illustrated dream journals for years. Um, and so you will see some symbolism from dreams in some of these drawings, but some of them are just straight up. Like this is Lizzie um on the you know on the side of her hospital bed are all her her little you know stuffed animals that that she loves and feels safe with and i just um, i mean those little guys just alive in the intensive care unit it's it's pretty intensive space to be in and um really i could feel like the life of those little characters and um and how they how they supported her and comforted her um this drawing over here is about um well liz first became sick in august of 1988 and it seems it just seemed that we would have these often hard things happen in August. It just seemed like a time when I noticed, wow, it's August, something crappy's happening again. Yeah. And, um, but I had had a dream about this lion and I didn't realize that um, I, I'm into astrology, not as thickly as some people, but I had never heard of the lion's gate, which is, um, I think it's August 8th. It's a, it's a, when a couple of planets align, it's, a, seen as a portal at any rate mm -hmm. but when i researched back that was when lizzie got sick and um anyway so i felt this need to just kind of describe her strength through the lion because she is this remarkably resilient strong spirit um that kind of symbolism comes in. Um, there's a drawing over there where it's called Riders on the Storm. And there's a, a, there's a little scene with a lighthouse. That's a, a place where I grew up, which feels like a personal place of power for me and part of my origins. And then again, these are some images that came through uh, some dreams that I had. Um, but I did work from photo references for these. And, that's not something I always do. I, um, I'm typically uh, somebody who likes to work from life. Like I've done whole series of portraits where people sit for me. That's my preferred way of working. Um, so that was a departure for me to uh, use photos of, as reference. Um, yeah. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll ask one last question for all of you, I mean, all of you, um, before we open it up to questions from the audience, which is, uh, what's one thing that you would most want people to take away from this work? Hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just hope. You know? And I think that There are times when it feels really far away, you know. Um, but it's there, and and I and I think too. I missed one thing. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, is is that it, it? It's like hope, but also like in community and in solidarity with others. Like uh, like knowing Celeste and Martha, and. Like, I mean, I like just like the, you don't have to go through it alone, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe it may be shaped in different ways, but there's there's so much there that's similar in terms of how, what we've what we've been through. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think of. Um, well, 
well, sometimes I wish I could go back to the Celeste in the mm. beginning of this mm. when I was really nervous mm. and just like, what is PD NOS mean? Like, pervasive mm -hmm. developmental delay, not otherwise specified, like, holy oh, crap, I have to remember that. Or what is, you know, everything was so mm. new. I felt so scared for her. Um, and I wish I could go back now and say, hey, it's, you know, this is a journey and your daughter's gonna find happiness and you're gonna find happiness. And um, so I guess just say that it's just, it's a journey. It's a process for learning and finding yourself. And I feel so much stronger as a woman, a person, a mother, an advocate now with Abigail than I did then. And so I have to say, you know, that's that. And like sometimes I would be plucked out of my situation. I would go visit family somewhere and I'd be sitting there by myself and I'm like I don't have to do anything I'm not like responsible I can just be myself and I would feel this this surge of like strength and like whoa this is really I'm like I'm good like this is good I'm, I'm growing um so I'd have little moments where I would feel all that and then I would go back and I'd be like so it's just like trying to get rid of that the agonizing piece where you just feel like you want to know the future and you can't. So just try to be in the present moment and enjoy what you're working on. Um, I guess a takeaway I would uh, wish for folks looking at my work is permission to tell your story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell your stories. Yeah. We've all got them. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I mean, we have, we're under the umbrella of children with special needs, but I love the, is it um, Elaine Strick, the comedian? I, I think it's her, or maybe it was her husband. Anyway, somebody had this wonderful quote that we're all dragging a sack of rocks. <laughs> and, um, you know, like tell about it, figure out how to tell about it. Um, and uh, yeah, be brave, tell your stories because we, you know, we need this human connection to each other so desperately. It's just what links us, our stories. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Um, thank you guys so much. Um, kind of on that note, um, Alicia, Martha, and Celeste want to invite any parents or caregivers that are either here or um, tuning in online. Um, but parents in similar circumstances, if you'd like to continue in this dialogue, share experiences, share resources, uh, please feel free to reach out to the gallery with your contact info and we'll put you guys in touch so that you can do that. Absolutely. Um, but for now, I will open it up to any questions from the audience. If anybody's got them. If you don't, we'll call it a day. I am well actually Alicia's husband. Um, first, I just want to mention to you, Mark, the first time I went to see this show, literally right before coming, I was uh, reading to Wesley uh, One Morning in Maine. Oh, I love that. And uh, it's wonderful coming in here because, of course, the illustrations just remind me of that style in some ways, particularly this painting here. Oh, I uh, love Robert here. McCloskey. Um, <laughs> really, uh, spoke to me so much because reading that book it was really it's just i think it's such a great way of portraying a child sort of discovering the world around them mm -hmm. and looking at this it's sort of this unusual feeling with the drawing is i'm looking at it and elizabeth is looking at it as well and i see the space of her imagination and what is going on looking in these things that evoke imagination in the book like um so yeah, first, thank you for that really moving to me. And um, one thing I was wondering is that for all of you, this um, obviously you're very much coming towards your uh, your artwork as mothers, but seeing all of this, it's so much connecting with uh, you know child. I was wondering if any of you have ever painted your own childhood experiences or as mothers gone back and been like, well, what is it like to not paint my child, but paint me as a child. And I was curious about that for each of you. 
So one thing I've been doing recently is thinking about, um, this is work that's not here, but about nests. <laughs> and um, in that I have been thinking about places that from my own, from my own childhood um, in that and trees and places that I've been um, as a younger person. I don't know if that's directly what you're talking about, but only in that way, in a new way. And it's like a new idea that is, is coming through. Um, I don't know that, I, I mean, I think that for me, some of the, I don't know if it's about my childhood necessarily, but yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Well, maybe that's a new series. <laughs> Not yet. Yeah. I think there's a lot of that in my dream journals because I process a ton from my childhood in my dreams. Yeah. And um, so I don't make it public in my outer work, but uh, if we were to flip through those, there's a bunch of little Marthas going through all kinds of stuff. <laughs> yeah. That's an interesting question. I, I don't know, for me, I feel as though there's this overlap where I'm trying to, maybe I have that sense of, I work with a lot of children, I see how they play and how they enjoy themselves. And, um, and so I think there might be something where I'm, you know, thinking about myself and that sense of movement and play and um, that I, I've always sort of wished for Abigail to kind of have that. Mm -hmm. um, it would always it would always be hard to find kids that would slow down enough to play with Abigail. Mm -hmm. So I feel as though there was some kind of maybe you know, trying to like kind of live through my childhood and trying to mm -hmm. encourage other kids to kind of feel and connect with her as much as I could. So it's a little sideways, but. There's a question. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess my question is uh, getting to art as therapy. How to get there? So I think I'm someone who deals with uh, chronic pain, and I create uh, still lives, but they're very beautiful still lives uh, photographs, right? So in that way, it's not really an honest representation of what I'm experiencing on a daily basis. And so in that way, it's not therapeutic. You know, creating something beautiful. It's not really coming from my daily experience. It's just more of a distraction, I think. Things I enjoy, but uh, it's not how I, it's not helping me process shitty feelings. Mm -hmm. So what are, your, what are your recommendations there? Uh, I feel like you guys are really seeing yourselves in your work and really honest with your experiences and somehow you're getting, you're getting them on paper. And I think you guys said, or someone said earlier, how it was kind of hard to see yourself honestly and you know show that and uh in my thought process the only way i can do that is okay you're photographing your children in the hospital facility so is that what i do is that what i photograph my experience in the hospital and, and show that but I, I don't know i'm not i'm not finding the therapy in it mm -hmm. and how how did you get there i guess is the question Ooh. Well, I'm, I'm not an art therapist. And yeah. It's so funny. I had a, one of my professors along the way um, really scolded me uh, after a crit one time. She said, art's not therapy, Martha. And I'm yeah. thinking, like hell. <laughs> <laughs> it is for me. But um, don't dis your um your process of making beautiful still lives as a distraction um you know that when you're in that creative space it's meditative there's a flow that goes on i don't know do you experience just like ah like your breathing slowing down and you're oh totally yeah it's a i mean that's space and time. that's yeah. therapeutic I, I, you know mm -hmm. art just doesn't have to express what, yeah. right i mean there's just gosh there's so many forms of art um uh yeah i just happen to be a little bit more on the expressionistic side of things where i, I just feel like i've got to get this stuff out um but you know some art is really focused on um 
on nature and the contemplative and um, who's to say what's therapeutic sure. for one person is yeah. not for another, but just making art is, I just think such a crucial healing function. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I would just add to that, that for me, I mean, I did have an art background, but when it came to paint, I didn't really know, I mean, this kind of painting, I, I didn't know how I wanted to express myself with it. Yeah. So it became more just the movement of it, just kind of the texture of it, just the feeling of it. And, um, and then, then it started telling me yeah. Where I wanted to so go. Starting with forcing yourself to go through the motions of it. Yeah, I, I would. That's how I think it helped. How it helped me. Like I think yeah. I had this all this heated stuff I wanted to say or feel or get out, but I couldn't do that because I just didn't know how. And yeah. so then it was more like, okay, I'm just going to let the paint massage me as best I can, and then let it slowly um, build oh, yeah. off of that. Yeah. And that sort of process when it's quiet and you're just doing that, for me, there's something nurturing about it and healing and it kind of goes back and forth and slowly, you know, something arrives and then you go, oh, okay. And it's personal. Yeah. I, uh, just to add and echo what they were saying, I would think that sometimes um, using medium that you're not comfortable with can help you, or not, not comfortable with it, something that's not familiar or trying mm -hmm. to do something in a new way yeah, um, and like little experiments that that can help break stuff up or break open yeah. open up a new way so it feels less like work exactly right yeah make yeah. play just make it play play yeah yeah mm -hmm. just to comment i just see a lot of bravery in you thank you oh thank you <laughs> i just had a question um you spoke briefly about symbolism in the paintings um, I also noticed that in all your works, there's either this combo of empty space or filling the space for each of you. Does that have a specific meaning? Um, I, I think for me, it does. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there needs, in some that there, there needs to be the, the frenetic big <laughs> energy um it needs to be represented and and, and be there um this painting over here uh, cradle needed to be a, re a relief relief from that mm -hmm. and and show um that there are breaks from the more chaotic um so that that is an intentional and that's harder to do mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> But it's but that's been a, like a chat like a challenge to myself for my own my own being right. It's like no, I need like I need to capture that too because there are those moments mm -hmm. where things feel more tran tranquil or feel like we're in right. in a different space. Um, right. So yeah, well, it's interesting that we can look at it in that way as the psychic space, but also. Uh, you know, just after teaching for years too, I'm like, let's think about our composition. <laughs> you know, we need a place for the eyes to yeah. rest yeah. Uh, okay. on the page, but that just is a metaphor for, right. you know, what we're talking about. But right. I mean, even look at just Kate's work of art was putting this show together and look at the space that she created between each of the pieces. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's like we have breaths that we take and there's times where the breath's all out. And we don't have to breathe for a second. Oh, that feels good. And then <laughs> back in it again. <laughs> yeah, I think with my pieces, I, I tend to want to fill all the space and, and then maybe give a little bit of elbow room and then build off and all this. And one of my, so as, I mean, like this piece and the one that's in the back room, um, Mama turned into the backyard tree. Mm -hmm. I feel as though I allowed myself because it felt like an emotional piece. Um, I allowed myself, okay, you're not going to build this up. You are <laughs> going to give it a lot of air yeah. to just let that 
feeling of what I was trying to say or be just hang there, you know? Yeah. So it does, it takes a lot more courage, I think, at times to um, to really just stop. Yeah. You know, it is. It just shows so, up. Yeah. Hard to edit and, and kill, like, what's that expression, kill your beauties? <laughs> I, I, I forget who said it, but, you know, there's just that. Um, also, I remember one of my teachers saying to me, you know, you don't have to tell every story in this one piece. <laughs> right, that's yeah. huge. Well, you know, yeah, it, it is huge. Because yeah. yeah. we do, we want to say, yeah, 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 that's it. That's it. Yeah. And it's just, you know, such a jumble of spaghetti, nobody can get into it. <laughs> much. Any other last questions? No? All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here this day.